Good morning, everyone. The hearing for the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights, and International Organizations will come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on FY 2020 budget and U.S.-Africa relations. So without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements, questions, and other materials for the record, subject to the length limitation in the rules. I recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. I want to thank our witnesses for being here with us today. I also want to thank the State Department and USAID staff, both here in D.C. and working all across the continent, for your service. During the past year, I have traveled on a number of CODELs, and I'm always impressed by the dedication and work of the staff. The focus of this hearing is on the fiscal year 2020 budget, and I also expect that we will spend some time addressing this administration's policy toward Africa, because as we all know, there is a direct correlation between our budget and our foreign policy priorities. Once again, this administration has proposed significant decreases in the requested budget for Africa. And as usual, Congress has not adopted many of this administration's proposals and in a bipartisan manner has appropriated aid at higher levels than those requested. U.S. engagement toward Africa is key in critical areas, including trade and investment, and it's time that we transition from aid to Africa to bilaterally trading with partners. The administration has promised to promote economic growth and trade in Africa through Prosper Africa. When I first heard about Pros Prosper Africa, I was interested because I know that trade and investment is ultimately a win-win for the continent and the United States. U.S. business can engage new markets and jobs are created across the continent. But how will Prosper Africa, with a $50 million program budget, help American businesses penetrate African markets? Have staff been hired for the deal teams we heard about? $50 million seems like a very small amount. Are there any success stories that you all can share with members of Congress and what sectors are gaining the most traction? Finally, where can Congress help fill in the gaps? The African market is simply too big for U.S. businesses not to export goods and services. But for U.S. businesses to be engaged across Africa, they need environments where they can do business. African governments must do their part by reducing trade barriers, having transparent banking uh, procedures and policies, and adhering to agreed upon business deals and contracts. There must be peace and security, and countries must democratically respect the human rights of their citizens. That is why U.S. policy must always be holistic. But just 2% of the fiscal year 2020 budget request was focused on democracy and governance, 6% on peace and security, 9% on economic growth. It would be incumbent upon us to make sure that the continent with one of the largest and youngest populations in the world is fully engaged, live in functioning democracies, and are able to express their civil liberties, especially free speech, freedom of the press, and assembly. We need to continue to provide opportunities for young professionals through the YALI program, but we must also find a way to help African youth develop vocational and technical skills. This will be one of the key ways to ensure that the youth bulge has a positive impact rather than the large numbers of youth being a challenge to African countries. I understand that U.S. policy toward the continent is diverse. I know we train many of the continent's military forces, help reduce infectious disease, and help build communities after devastating floods, such as the cyclone in Mozambique this year, among other things. But we must have ambassadors at every U.S. embassy in Africa, and we must have accurate embassy personnel to help fulfill our missions in Africa. While leading a CODEL with members of Congress, we had a chance to see some of the military engagement taking place in Djibouti, Niger, and Burkina Faso. The terrorist threat is real, and we must have to ensure that U.S. policy toward the Sahel is holistic, and we must ensure that embassies have what they need to do their jobs effectively, whether that be funding or staff. That said, it is critical that U.S. policy is continually addressing the root cause of increasing security, insecurity. We know that oftentimes people turn to violent extremism because of a lack of opportunities, marginalization, or poverty. So I'll be looking to hear about our development programs in this region, as we've talked about last week. 
Uh, with that, I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses on the issues I have raised and others such as Ebola containment in the DRC and its border regions, combating the suppression of journalists and citizens who disagree with their governments, or the challenges of young people migrating to urban cities looking for opportunities that may or may not exist. It would be good to hear about U.S. policy towards Sudan and Cameroon. I know my office continues to get a number of calls regarding Cameroon. I'm also hearing a great deal of concern from people about crackdowns on journalists and activists in Nigeria. I also want to hear about the bright spots and our strong partners on the continent. Members of Congress on both sides want to ensure that Africa is not being neglected and appropriate funding is going toward our diplomacy, defense, and development strategy, but also trade and investment in the region. I now recognize the ranking member for the purpose of making his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for calling this important hearing. And I thought our hearing last week uh, on the Sahel was uh, extraordinarily effective. And we welcome back uh, Ms. Uh, Anderson for uh, twice in within 10 days. So thank you for being here again. And of course, uh, the Honorable uh, Naj, uh, thank you. The Assistant Secretary, uh, uh, thank you for your uh, tremendous work as well. Um, as we serve our relations with Africa and the alignment of our budget with our priorities, let us first accentuate, I think, some real positive uh, breakthroughs. We provide a tremendous amount of humanitarian assistance and health aid, particularly via PEPFAR, and our combating of HIV AIDS as well as tuberculosis and malaria. Amazingly, we also appear to be winning the fight against Ebola, uh, the outbreak in eastern DR Congo, and I hope you will spend some time uh, updating the committee on that. Uh, we've gotten reviews. I checked the USAID uh, fact sheet, which is constantly being uh, updated. Uh, the fact that, that healthcare workers uh, have been able to get vaccinated against it means that their, their ability to do their life-saving work is, uh, is exponentially enhanced. Uh, the fact that, that their, the um, therapeutics uh, are helping people to live, which used to be almost an automatic death sentence under Ebola, uh, gives great hope for the future and for any future outbreak, but obviously we need to be concerned about this one first and foremost. So. Uh, thank you for your good work. I know a very high-level meeting a set of, of people led by uh, Health and Human Services uh, Administrator, uh, Secretary Azar, uh, traveled to the region. Uh, Dr. Fauci was with them, uh, and I read their comments and had conversations with them about uh, the remarkable breakthroughs that are being made. So uh, please spend some time in, in giving us updates uh, on that, if you would. We're also making an impact via our nutrition and ag-led food assistance programs such as Feed the Future, which had its roots in the Bush administration and, and was expanded uh, under President Obama. There are concerns, however, uh, with perceived U.S. disengagement from Sub-Saharan Africa at a time when competitors such as China, Russia, and even Turkey are increasing their engagement. We also have the problematic or the problems of Islamic extremism to contend with. Indeed, neither the Trump administration nor the Obama administration before it uh, appear to, to come close to the impact which the Bush administration had on uh, its leaders. I mean, he made Africa an absolute priority, and I think that we are still seeing the positive uh, consequences from that, especially with PEPFAR, uh, which has, and the malaria initiative, which has saved so many lives, uh, uh, including little babies through mother-to-child transmission, uh, which, um, you know, those kids have been spared the agony of being uh, con afflicted uh, with that terrible disease. I want to especially thank Mark Green, um, who used to sit on our committee uh, back in the 90s when I was chairman of the, uh, of the committee. He was, was a tremendous asset then, very knowledgeable. Went on to become, as we all know, the ambassador to Tanzania, where he, he did tremendous work, particularly with PEPFAR and other initiatives. And now we have a, a man who really gets it, understands it, has lived it, uh, leading USAID. So I want to uh, please convey our best uh, to Mark uh, for his work. Uh, which I think is extraordinary. Uh, let me just say, finally, you know, there's some great breakthroughs. Uh, the chairwoman and I did uh, travel and meet in Ethiopia with uh, Abe uh, soon after he came into uh, power. Um, the fact that he got the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, was a very encouraging recognition uh, of the dramatic change and reversal of, of trend lines in Ethiopia, particularly as it relates to human rights. And I, I know that he'll run into headwinds. It's inevitable. Uh, but if you could speak to that, because I do think you know he's a a, uh, a leader with whom uh, I know both of us walked away with a great sense of hope and expectation. Uh, we got to make sure that we're backing him to the greatest extent possible. So thank you. I have other things. I'd like to ask for my full statement to be made a part of the record. 
uh, and yield back. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Naj, a retired career Foreign Service officer, spent 32 years in government service, including over 20 in assignments across Africa. He served as the U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia, Guinea, as well as Deputy Chief of Mission in Nigeria, Cameroon, and Togo. Ambassador Naj has received numerous awards from the U.S. State Department in recognition of his service, including commendations for helping prevent famine in Ethiopia, supporting the evacuation of Americans from Sierra Leone during a violent insurrection, supporting efforts to end the Ethiopian-Eritrean War, and managing the U.S. Embassy in Lagos, Nigeria during political and economic crisis. Our second witness, Cheryl Anderson, is the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Africa, where she has been responsible for West Africa and development planning. Before that, she served as the Acting Assistant Administrator for Africa. Ms. Anderson joined USAID as a Foreign Service Officer in 1988 and has extensive field experience. She served as USAID Mission Director for South and Southern Africa, Ghana, and East Africa, and as Deputy Mission Director for East Africa. Before that, her overseas assignments included Sudan, Eastern and Southern Africa Regional, Uganda, and DRC. She also worked in headquarters in what was called the Asia and Near East Bureau and in London for HealthLink Worldwide. She began her career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana. I want to welcome both of you and um, welcome your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, with your permission, I will uh, submit the longer statement and read an abbreviated statement for time's sake. Chair Bass, Ranking Member Smith, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the President's FY2020 budget request for foreign assistance Sub-Saharan Africa. I very much appreciate the role of this subcommittee in advancing American values and interests in Africa. I am pleased to be joined by my USA colleague Cheryl Anderson. Our engagement in Africa is truly a team effort. I would also like to recognize the dedicated people of the State Department and USAID serving at our missions in Africa here in Washington. Africa is a continent of both potentials and problems. It is home to some of the fastest growing economies in the world with burgeoning middle classes that create opportunities for expanded commerce. At the same time, some African partners are confronted with serious instability and security problems, including from violent extremists. Africa is a point of global interest and geostrategic competition. To address these and additional foreign policy and strategic priorities, the President's FY 2020 Foreign Assistance Budget requests $4.9 billion for Africa. Consistent with the Administration's Africa strategy, this budget will support our goals to <coughs> excuse me, promote trade and commercial ties to increase prosperity, strengthen peace and security efforts, support democracy, human rights, and good governance, and address communicable diseases. With Africa's population projected to double to two billion people by 2050, the continent needs a stable and prosperous environment to harness the potential of this burgeoning youth population and create alternatives to the poverty that leads to violent extremism and despair. This budget request therefore puts additional emphasis on funding for economic growth activities, Specifically, <clears throat> we request funds to support Prosper Africa, a whole-of-government initiative to increase two-way trade between U.S. and African partners, and additional funds for Power Africa. Our request also supports an important investment in Africa's youth, the Young African Leaders Initiative, YALI, which now has over 600,000 members in its network. While not part of this request, we also hope to expand university partnerships between Africa and the United States. We also seek to leverage recent historic changes in several African countries. We recognize the opportunities in Ethiopia to build on this year's Nobel Peace Prize awardee, Prime Minister Abiy's reform agenda, as well as in the Democratic Republic of the Congo to support President Chisikedi's efforts. Looking ahead, we aim to contribute to Sudan's transitional government's efforts to establish a civilian-led government. We also strongly support debt relief for Somalia, which is critical to advance the political, security, economic reforms necessary for the strategic country stabilization. Our request recognizes the growing problems faced in the Sahel and Lake Chad region. We seek to continue to support the G5 Sahel countries bilaterally 
as they implement a comprehensive strategy and conduct counterterrorism operations that respect human rights. We will continue to build peacekeeping capacity in more than 20 African countries. In 2018, these efforts trained more than 27,000 African peacekeepers. The budget request would provide robust assistance to advance health outcomes across the continent. It also continues to support democracy, strengthening programs, more effective governance, and to promote transparency. These investments represent America's values and provide a counterpoint to those who seek to exploit African countries for their own economic or geopolitical advantage or subvert Africans' desire for democracy. No other nation can match the breadth and depth of America's long-term engagement on the continent. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to hearing your views and answering your questions. Wonderful, Ms. Anderson. Good morning, Chair Bass, Ranking Member Smith, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today about the United States investments in Sub-Saharan Africa. We're grateful for the committee's continuing support for the work of the United States Agency for International Development. And I'm pleased to have this opportunity to present our plans as outlined in the President's budget request for fiscal year 2020. As USAID Administrator Mark Green always says, the goal of foreign assistance should be to end the need for its existence. Administrator Green and the Trump administration have a deep commitment to the continent. In fact, the administrator has traveled to more than 12 African countries since joining USAID. His very first trip as administrator was to Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Sudan. We know that our assistance is having a transformative impact in sub-Saharan Africa, and we need to continue to ensure that it's helping our partner countries move towards self-reliance. The total FY24 and assistance budget request for Sub-Saharan Africa is $4.9 billion. In FY20, our resources are allocated based on the overarching policy priorities laid out in the President's budget, the national security strategy, the U.S. government's Africa strategy, and the state USAID joint regional strategy. The request supports the President's goals to strengthen national security, assert U.S. influence, generate economic opportunities for Americans, and ensure the effectiveness and efficiency of U.S. foreign assistance. Many of the biggest security threats the United States faces, including terrorism, pandemics, and transnational organized crime, are incubated and thrive in weak failing and failed states. The FY20 request addresses key U.S. priorities in Africa, including countering regional and local violent extremist groups in the Sahel, the Lake Chad region, and the Horn of Africa. The FY20 request of $107.2 million for democracy programs will help counter political fragility and support more effective citizen-responsive governance. This is necessary to ensure that corruption, failure to deliver basic services, and lack of transparency don't grow worse in unstable regions threatening the United States and its allies. For more than 58 years, USAID programs have saved and improved lives around the world. Our global health programs support control of the HIV, HIV epidemic, prevent child and maternal deaths, and combat infectious disease threats, programs that are hallmarks of U.S. leadership in the world. The FY20 resources will support robust funding for health programs, including PEPFAR, providing opportunities to control epidemics and disease in key targeted countries. Of the FY20 request for Africa, approximately 81% is allocated to global health programs. The FY20 request supports $2.86 billion for PEPFAR and $1.13 billion for other health programs, including malaria, tuberculosis, and maternal and child health. A number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa have experienced rapid economic growth and significant poverty reduction. USAID looks to the opportunities presented by trade and investment 
They are among the fastest ways for Africa to boost its growth. The FY20 request will advance economic growth and bolster governance programs that create an enabling environment for U.S. businesses. The U.S. government's new Prosper Africa initiative will enhance our efforts. The FY20 request level of $50 million for Prosper Africa will boost two-way trade and investment between the United States and Africa. We will expand the market-driven approach that's been the cornerstone of Power Africa. Our FY20 request of $70 million will continue progress towards the goal of Power Africa 2.0 and respond to emerging, emerging energy investment opportunities. Funding will support activities targeting key policy reforms, increased opportunities for U.S. firms, and additional investment in energy transmission and distribution. The FY20 Africa food security request of $221.7 million for 15 countries and four regional operating units will support inclusive agriculture-led growth with a focus on improving agricultural productivity, expanding markets and trade, and increasing the economic resilience of rural communities that are vulnerable to humanitarian crises. We intend to uphold the administration's commitment to ensure effectiveness and accountability to the U.S. taxpayer. The United States has a continued commitment to a partnership with African governments, the private sector, civil society, as well as other donors, grounded in mutual responsibility and respect. USAID has a very real role in safeguarding the United States national security and economic opportunities. As we continue to work with our partners toward our shared goals over the coming months, I look forward to our continued conversation on USAID's work in Africa. Thank you, Chair Bass and members of the subcommittee. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and responding to your questions. Well, once again, I want to thank you for taking the time out um, to come and meet with our committee today. And we'll move into now um, questions. So each member has five minutes. And we'll go through a round of five minutes. And if anybody wants to ask further questions after that, there'll be an opportunity to. Um, I wanted to uh, begin by talking about uh, governance. Um, the administration's emphasis is on promoting democratic governance in Africa. However, the proposal is to cut governance-related aids by two-thirds compared to FY 2018 levels. So I wanted to know how you uh, reconcile that, considering that the administration's priority is on promoting democratic governance. Ambassador? Thank you very much. Um, budgets are always a compromise of priorities. As you said, Madam Chair, yes, governance is a priority, but there are so many other priorities, and we absolutely have to uh, figure out what the right mix is between all of them and the funding that's available. With governance, um, there's also a fundamental factor that oftentimes good governance doesn't cost a penny. It depends on the willingness of the country at hand to be responsible in their governance. Uh, it's also a pot that other countries could certainly contribute to, whether it's the Nordics, whether it's the British, whether it's the French, or some of our other allies. So from our perspective, looking at all of the different priorities, yes, governance is extremely important, but so, of course, is peace and security, and so, of course, is uh, trade and investment. Right, but, I mean, if you look at the budget, it's 81% uh, on health, and then, um, what is it, 2%? Right. on democracy and governance. And so I, I do have a question about health because devoting 81% of our budget uh, toward health, what are we doing to help the African countries develop the capacity uh, to increase their health systems themselves as opposed to us providing direct services? How do we help them develop the capacity? We know that with the Ebola outbreak several years ago, that one of the reasons it hit those three countries was because they really didn't have any health infrastructure. So what are we doing to think about it long term? Are we going to have 80% of our budget from now until eternity? Or, you know, how do we move beyond this? The FY20 budget request is 107.2 million for democracy rights and governance. 
that uh, we, we share the subcommittee's concern and, and commitment to, to democracy rights and governance. As a proportion of the total, that is actually consistent with previous um, year's requests. Uh, I would like to say that citizen responsive governance is so central to our approach as we're working towards self-reliance in our partner countries. So when we look at our, we've got a, a, a new set of roadmaps for each of our countries. And if you look at, you look at the, the roadmaps and what we're measuring and what we're working on towards self-reliance in the two categories of commitment and capacity, we're looking at a lot of democracy and governance well, issues. Well, actually, I would really appreciate it if you would refer to the health infrastructure. Okay, so, so 81 percent, what is going toward health, health infrastructure as opposed to providing direct services? Right, so governance is actually an important part of what we're doing in health and in fact in other sectors so that we can build capacity of those systems to serve the people and to continue to operate so that one day we won't have to be um, investing as much uh, money into those systems. So maybe you could give me an example, because I'm For not example, understanding. For uh, example, one of the more important uh, elements in, um, in uh, any, any of our health programs is, is the delivery of services. So uh, a significant portion of our resources go for training of staff and for ensuring that, those, that, that the health systems uh, are, are serving the people. Could you name so a country? That, 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 in a way, is governance, and we, we, we deliver the health programs with uh, integrated governance uh, approach. Could you, could you name a country or give an example of where our assistance has been able to move the country toward being able to take care of their own health needs? I can talk about, for example, South Africa, where I've worked m more recently. We worked uh, with the government to not only build the, help build the capacity of the health staff and the health system to deliver prevention, especially care and treatment for HIV, and then also worked with them so that they could look at their budgets and do the kind of planning that's necessary to be devoting the, uh, the budget necessary to, to handle the, the HIV prevention I, in the future. I just have one minute left. Could you give me examples of Prosper Africa of what we're doing with that money? Uh, do you want to take that? I can also. While we're waiting for the money, let me tell you what we've already started doing, Madam okay. Chair. At every one of our uh, U.S. embassies, we have implemented the deal teams with current resources, which means everybody from the ambassador down to the first tour communicators is going to be engaged in looking for deals, helping American businesses, and then we're on the substantive side working with the governments at hand to improve their business climate. There have been some remarkable examples. When you have a willing partner, for example, Togo jumped 40 points in the ease of doing business rankings this past year. Um, I will be happy to furnish you, I didn't bring it with me, but a list of successful de deals okay. that we've had recently. I would very much like to see that. My time is up. Uh, we'll turn it over to the ranking member. And I'll have more questions on the next round. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, since Secretary Naj, you mentioned debt relief for Somalia. I met with <coughs> Ambassador Shavit Ahmed um, recently and talked about the issue of debt, which is crippling uh, a country that is making significant progress of late. Um, how are we doing on that? And are we coordinating with other countries to make sure that their debt, the debt burden of Somalia to them is reduced or eliminated completely? Secondly, on the Ebola, if you could you know, speak to that in greater detail and also provide for the record information, I guess that would be Ms. Anderson who might want to uh, focus on that. Uh, third, um, in the last Congress, I chaired hearings and, and the subcommittee conducted extensive oversight with respect to our ARV supply chain. And I wonder if you can update us on that. Uh, is the contract with Chemonix um, coming up for renewal or rebidding? And what reforms have been undertaken? Will the Technical Evaluation Committee now include members from the field? Will in-person interviews be required and demonstrations of any IT equipment be standard operating procedures? And has the Office of Global AIDS Coordinator been fully integrated into the selection process? Because, again, this was a very serious deficiency um, that dated over two administrations, and we're hoping that's been fixed. I have other questions, but I'll 
Mr. Smith, I'll start quickly on Somalia. We absolutely support uh, debt relief for Somalia. We now have a, we believe, especially with the Prime Minister Kyrie, a very able and capable partner. Uh, you know, we may not be yet seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, but we know it's not a train. Yeah. So, uh, you know, absolutely. One of my former members of my staff is actually deployed there, and the feedback we get from him is that it, things are truly, I mean, that's just one person, but I know the embassy. But absolutely. Now, you know, it's made a huge difference having Ambassador Don Yamamoto on the ground, and I'll turn it over to Cheryl. Okay. On, uh, should we turn to Ebola? Yes, please. Okay. So as of uh, the most recent report, we've had 3,300 confirmed and probable cases and 2,200 deaths. So we're seeing lower numbers of new cases, and that is significant, but we can't say yet that we've turned the corner. I think we can say that maybe we can start to see that corner. Uh, and there's no reason to let up on our efforts. We have to continue to contain and control and eventually end this outbreak. We'll continue our case detection and management and the tracing of contacts, which is essential. We have to ensure that we continue an effective vaccine strategy. Uh, and then community engagement is especially important in this part of um, Eastern Congo, where communities are very distrustful of not only their government, but international efforts. And we've learned a lot uh, about building trust in the communities. And then we have to continue uh, our leadership with, um, with the partner governments, as well as other players in the arena. So we need to look at the ring countries, the countries around uh, where the outbreak is, Rwanda, Uganda, South Sudan, we're especially worried about, and Bur Burundi, excuse me. And we have to s continue the screening at the borders and the surveillance in those countries, and we have to make sure that those health systems are prepared and they know what to do if a case is suspected. And we know that there'll be future outbreaks maybe not in the same place, but we also have to make sure that those health systems continue to be strong and we'll be able to respond to outbreaks. So the picture is starting to look better with fewer new cases, but we have to keep, absolutely keep up our efforts. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Uh, Secretary Naj, if you could get back with what we're doing to coordinate with other countries vis-a-vis -vis the debt burden. Uh, suffered by, by sure absolutely we are in is that, is close crippling, uh, close consultation with everybody so that we act and join if you could provide the, that for the of record, that, that would be very helpful because abs because of the debt absolutely let me ask you uh, you know I'm the author of the neglected tropical disease bill which passed the full committee will be on the floor I hope soon and one of the focal points of that legislation is intestinal worms which also impact the e efficacy of our nutrition programs and I wonder if you could just fill us in on the progress that's being made in that area? Do we, are deworming programs, for example, being coordinated with our nutrition and WASH programs? Okay, yeah, I, I, that's a, an essential part of the work that we're doing in health and nutrition. And uh, I think we would be very happy to give you further information or additional briefing on, on that. Okay, would you, uh, you know, to the? Yes. Let me, uh, oh, out, of out of time. We will come back around. Um, Representative Wild. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Ms. Anderson, I wanted to follow up on uh, your answers about <coughs> the, pro the problem of um, infectious diseases and specifically um, talk about the US-led DREAMS initiative, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, which notably is a public-private partnership that helps girls develop into, the acronym stands for Determined, Resilient, Empowered, AIDS-Free, Mentored, and Safe Women. And I understand that it's been particularly uh, successful in prevention of HIV infection among girls younger than 18 years of age. So I'd like to hear from you about some of the successes and challenges of this program, and, and more importantly, how would you suggest that we expand pro that program and programs like that? One of the most challenging parts of the fight against HIV and AIDS is prevention. And, and 
the kind of behavior change that's needed to prevent HIV because people's behavior and their opinions, their attitudes keep changing. And so we have become extremely worried in recent years about young women and adolescent girls uh, and the infection rates among that part of the population. So when we started the DREAMS initiative, it was an effort to look at what can we really do to make sure that those uh, young women and adolescent girls are empowered uh, in their lives with the information and the education and the networks and the resources that they need to prevent uh, HIV. And so I think it has been pretty exciting to see the progress. And we've taken a different approach in each country where it's been a, a priority uh, for DREAMS, mostly in the Southern Africa countries. And I think that uh, one of the things that we've learned is that we really have to listen to the, the young women and the girls and understand what their, what their situations are, what their needs are, so that we can work with especially local organizations to support their needs and, and, and ensure that they, have, uh, that they have not only healthy lives, but they have a good future and they have the opportunity to seize whatever opportunities they want. Let me, uh, let me just, because I, I, I don't have that much time and I want to get to some specifics. So what are some of the things that are done to make sure that we're reaching those girls, number one? And if you could also address, what is the private aspect of this public-private partnership? Who are the private players that are involved? Yeah, let, let, let me start on the, uh, the private uh, aspect. Uh, it's something that we're, we're trying to do across the board is engage the private sector wherever we can find private sector support for our efforts or a private sector solution. Uh, we could I'd be happy to get back to you with more details about the, the current major partners in DREAMS. Uh, I know that uh, there were several major um, US companies that were involved at least in the early years. Um, a couple of the things that we do is just to support girls, um, so girl, g girls, groups of girls, uh, to be able to talk about what's important in their lives and to, to provide support to each other. And but how do uh, they know this program is available? Pardon? How do we reach them? How do we? How do they know this program is available? That, it's one thing to say we want to listen yes, to this. Yes, that's right. How do they know about that, it? That's why it's so important to work with our local partners, with organizations that are present in the countries where we operate uh, so, and, and are on the ground in the communities. So we've seen uh, real responsiveness to these kinds of, um, uh, this kind of uh, group, groups of girls that can uh, receive information about what they need especially to prevent HIV. Another aspect, really important aspect of it is education. So ensuring that girls have the opportunities. We have uh, invested in girls' education, uh, ensuring that girls make the transition from the primary level to the secondary level in education. That's, we found that that's been very effective in helping them, especially in preventing HIV. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Mr. Pritchett. Thank you, Chair Lady, Ranking Member. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I, my knowledge of Africa is very limited, um, mainly like a lot of these folks, if they were honest, probably from reading National Geographic. And um, occasionally I, we'd have a missionary come in. But as a young man, I was struck when a missionary told us that uh, we're, we've lost actual whole language groups in Africa due to HIV and these other devastating diseases. So I. Uh, I salute um, our ranking member and our chair lady for the good work that y'all been doing on this before I got up here, and I hope I don't wreck it. So, um, but my question actually, since we've dealt a lot with the health care, I would have moved down to something else that I'm very interested in. It's the fact that we invest billions of dollars in these assistance programs every year, yet the Chinese seem to be gaining ground in the favorability and preference. How is the U.S. rethinking how we message our uh, assistance programs? Okay. And y'all can just kind of uh, jump uh, in. Could not agree with you more, sir. Uh, sir, that'll get you in trouble up here. I just want to <laughs> warn you, I'm agreeing with you. The, the, the Chinese literally have been eating our lunch for many years until we woke up 
and we finally realize that it's uh, not just an African threat, it's a global threat, and it's not just in trade, but it's in a whole system uh, that they envision a Chinese future. That's, I, I don't want to say that Prosper Africa is in response to China's global threat. Prosper Africa is really to dramatically increase U.S. trade and investment because the way to win is not to knock what the Chinese are doing as much as to promoting what the United States stands for, what American businesses can do. Uh, I, I can go through the list of, of the positive things that American businesses do when they contribute in Africa, what a U U.S. university partnership with an African university means as opposed to somebody else and on, and also a systematic, strategic, public diplomacy campaign that is outward looking instead of defensive. Every t I have visited 22 countries uh, during my first year on the job, and in every country I make public speeches about that, and in so many countries the next day the Chinese ambassador takes out a full page ad in the newspaper to respond to what I have said. Uh, it's to promote America because if Africans are given a choice, yes, they select what we stand for. And we just want to make sure that Africans have a choice, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Ma'am? I, I would that's say one very, of the important... That's a very cool scarf, by the way. Purple's my favorite color. It's actually the color of royalty. Oh, thank you. I had trouble with my colors as a young man, and my mama would always point at cars. And I remember uh, Dodge and Chrysler had one called um, um, Plum Crazy, and that was purple. And... Now I sleep with a, a purple quilt that my mama made for me, but please continue. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think one of the important aspects of Prosper Africa is that w we encourage a, a good business climate that's rules-based and transparent and gives a level playing field for good businesses to be able to invest and trade. Uh, I, I would also say that I, I think I heard recently that China's investment in sub-Saharan Africa has increased 220 percent since 2010. So uh, this is 220 percent since 2010. I, um, you, you know, I, I wouldn't I, be opposed to that if they were wanting to help folks out and feed yes. hungry folks and and help us with some of these catastrophic diseases, but I think it's just, it's just world domination. I mean, it's, I mean, their ultimate goal is to control Africa. Well, they are a big player, and they, they are getting increasingly engaged in, in di diplomatic and development engagement. So I think we are concerned about China's model of development. I mean, they're, we risk uh, unsustainable debt, we risk uh, corruption, corrupt practices, authoritarian approaches, uh, sometimes undermining transparency and, and accountability. So um, as a contrast, the, the model that we present for development in, in, in supporting our partner countries in their journeys to self-reliance Really, we, we have a shared goal of self-reliance in the future. Citizen responsive governance, the rule of law, and responsible economic growth. So I think we present a model and a kind of partnership that really takes our partner countries to a better place. What, what, what do you think um, Chinese investments are, a, at what point are they a threat to our interest, including the diplomatic and development and security objectives in China, I mean, in, in Africa? One clear industry, of course, is uh, information technology. If African countries, one after the other, select their manufacturers to build their, uh, infra their cyber infrastructure, that opens it up to all types of uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, then, then you find buildings with strange wires going to different places. Uh, we do our best to warn our African partners uh, State-owned enterprises can offer very good deals, and often uh, they do select that. So that is definitely a, a, a long-term threat because we're talking G5 and down the line G6 and on and on, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chair Lady. I appreciate your hospitality. The ranking member, he has to. He's stuck with me, but you don't, <laughs> and you are always very hospitable to me. So thank and we, you, And we're going to take you on a Codell in January. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Hulan. Might not let me go. <laughs>
Thank you. And uh, I would like to press a little bit on some of those, the conversations that we just had. Uh, one is that I uh, helped uh, author a letter that asked our Secretary uh, Pompeo to visit this region, to visit Sub-Saharan Africa. And in about a year's time, he has not yet once visited that area. And I know that you mentioned that you would visited 20 countries, which obviously I very much appreciate. My question is 22. Um, my question is, with 25 of us representing that that's an important issue to us, would you be able to bring that message back to the Secretary on our behalf? I will be happy to. Uh, to be fair, the Secretary did visit Africa the month before he took over this job uh, in his previous capacity. We've had the Deputy Secretary several times, the Under Secretary a couple of times. I've gone 22 times. My Deputy Assistant Secretary, who I think testified last week, has gone a number of times. So to be fair, I think Africa is, is very well covered. And I promise to hit the other 24 countries during whatever time I have left. I would just love it if you would convey to the secretary that it, his presence to. is just as important, if not more so. And uh, when you particularly talk about the influence of the Chinese, clearly they're watching who's coming to the area. And if he's not coming, then that's an indicator of our priorities. Uh, also, I would love to follow up on the conversation that we just had, which is speaking of priorities, um, money indicates where our priorities are. And when I look at this graph, what I see is every year of this current administration, the request has been less than, significantly less than it has been in prior years. Every year so far, we've effectively negated that request by fully funding or, or more than fully funding requests. When you talk about China and the fact that in that same time span they've increased their budget 220 percent, you know, there's an expression, your money where your mouth is. It, it feels like if we really are worried about the influence, rising influence of China and Russia on the continent, on sub-Saharan Africa, then why in the world would we have a budget that is less than what we have historically had rather than more than that? So would you be able to help me understand that as well? Yes, ma'am. The best I can say is that uh, global priorities, global competing priorities, uh, amount of funds available. I have been U.S. government employee since 1972, and I have had multiple budgets. What I can promise is whatever budgetary resources are made available to me, I will optimize them as well as possible um, and spread them out as well as possible. On the Chinese investment, we're talking about Chinese state-owned enterprises. If we properly mobilize the U.S. private sector, they will blow away whatever investments the Chinese can bring. That is why I am adamant about bringing as much U.S. private sector investment to Africa as possible so that we can show them what is the true strength of America. It's, we don't have state-owned enterprises. We are capitalist. We have the private sector. They can bring untold amount of resources. They will hire the young Africans. They take care of the environment. They don't give bribes. They don't smuggle ivory back to the United States, and they don't bring thousands of Americans to take African jobs. And I am a proud capitalist myself as well. I do believe that there is you know, an enormous uh, contribution that our businesses can make to the continent, but we also have to lead with the example of the government. The government has to make it an attractive opportunity for people uh, in business to be there. And right now, the indicators are that they don't value that, that we don't value that as a nation. Um, so I wanted to kind of dig in a little bit into the military aspects of this. Uh, increasingly, the African nations are being more and more uh, aligned and turned towards Russia and turned towards China for their acquisitions, uh, largely because I believe uh, a bunch of reasons, but one might be that they feel as though that's where their uh, alliances may lie in the future, and also because we uh, appropriately have restrictions for countries that have human rights violations. Can you speak to the uh, efficacy of our efforts to build uh, Africa relationships, uh, military relationships, and how can we alter U.S. security assistance to be more effective in the light of the competition that we have with Russia and with China in the military area? Absolutely. You're right about the, the weapons. We have uh, very severe uh, limits on furnishing weapons to certain people, but especially to the not to certain other people. However, I can assure you from my own visits in Africa, African partners much prefer our training, our interactions, and our equipment if they can get it. Um, I, I can't speak for my uh, colleagues at the Department of Defense and their military procurement process, but uh, it, it, 
we are not the quickest in furnishing equipment because of all the safety checks on us, which in a democracy we need to have. But we are doing training all over the continent. As I mentioned, I think in my opening remarks, we've done like 27,000. We've trained 27,000 Africans during the last year. And more and more Africans are the ones who are participating in their own peacekeeping. Uh, a number of African armies are very efficient. Uh, they are wanting to make the turn from what strategically have been country versus country armies, to, especially in the Sahel region, which we were talking about, to armies that can react very quickly to uh, insurgent threats. So our training is the gold standard. And I don't know how much time I have left. You're, you're out. I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you very much okay. <laughs> for your time. And but maybe I'm I'll happy be able to, to save back other to questions. You. Uh, I'm yeah. happy to come back to you on another round if you'd like. Thank you. Representative Omar. Thank you, Chairwoman uh, and Ranking Member. Uh, Ambassador Naj, uh, you just told uh, Mr. Smith that you strongly supported the debt relief um, for Somalia. Uh, and so I'm curious on why it took so long for you to put in the re, um, request for the required authorization. Um, and doesn't that risk us having uh, the opportunity to do it in a timely manner? I certainly hope not. I mean, obviously, it was an internal U.S. government decision process that we had to go through. Uh, it's not flipping the switch. It's, it, it's having a, a lengthy discussion. And it took, it took a while, uh, to be quite honest, to get to that point because it took a while to get to the point where we feel like we now have a, a genuine partner that we can deal with that you know the history of Somalia much better than I do of how many interim governments there have been and, and on and on and on in the cycle. We're all very optimistic now, so we want to push forward as much as possible and, and finally get to the recovery stage, the stabilization stage, and all the external and internal factors at play there. So we will do our absolute best, but it is a, uh, it, it's not a single uh, office decision-making process. No, I, I, I am uh, with you in that. It's been remarkable to see the, the steps um, that the current government in, in Somalia has taken to get closer to having this um, uh, process take place. Um, we've heard from Treasury, and, and we just hope that the State Department will also move as swiftly as possible, um, because that, that gets Somalia a step closer mm -hmm. um, to, to the kind of stability that we all want it uh, to have. Um, I also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the use of sanctions in Africa, um, the Sentry uh, put out a, a new report late October about how effective or ineffective our sanction policy has been. And according to their report, as with security assistance and airstrikes, it seems a lot like of our, our African sanctions are not tied to a clear um, interagency political strategy. They found that there isn't a clear exit strategy for sanctions that we have. Um, and by this, I mean that it's often not clear to sanctioned individuals or entities what exactly they need to do to be delisted. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the state um, and Treasury when it comes to these sanctions? How are these sanctions currently um, uh, existing in Africa, particularly in South Sudan, in Zimbabwe? in the DRC and elsewhere, uh, part of a larger strategy for those places. And in each of these cases, what are the conditions in which these uh, sanctions could be lifted? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Um, sanctions are a, a very closely integrated interagency process discussed between a number of agencies. And a, as you know, there are the different types in response to corruption, in response to uh, human rights violations. Then some are visa restrictions. Others are uh, keeping people and their family members out of the financial system. So different agencies have different responsibilities. There is almost always a fairly lengthy process, also the enforcement mechanism, to see how easy it is to enforce it. Are the targeted people actually uh, participating in international commerce so it makes a difference? as opposed to if you have somebody uh, sanctions on somebody they never participate in international commerce and it really doesn't make a difference. I, I can tell you, recent sanctions that we have done in response to uh, 
identifiable events, and I don't want to go into the sausage making process, but they have been extremely well received. Uh, for example, a recent ones in Zimbabwe were made a very strong point, um, as in uh, Sudan, as in the DRC. So we, we are, I, I can assure you, we are being very strategic, very targeted, uh, quite a bit of deliberation. The one issue you mentioned about getting out from under sanctions, I absolutely agree with you, because the other day I was looking at some and we still have some sanctions on people who are deceased. Right. So th that is something that we absolutely have to go through and, and, and go through the process. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, the, the, the chairwoman probably gets uh, as many visits from African um, embassies as, as my office does, uh, and many of these countries come to our office completely confused um, about the, the, the process out of, of these sanctions. Um, and, and I think it would be beneficial uh, for us to have a more coherent, um, uh, concise uh, process because ultimately we want bad actors to be rooted out and we want, right, prosperity um, for, for African nations. Um, and if we are not uh, communicative um, on how to get there, then, then it's, it's, it's not effective. Um, Ms. Anderson, <coughs> Uh, I think many of the um, work in um, U U USAID um, in, in the region um, of Africa was something that um, we had a lot of conversations about as we visited um, different parts of, of Africa in, in the last five trips uh, that the chairwoman and myself have taken. Um, we have a new uh, dr drone pace in northern Niger um, that just started operations a couple of weeks ago um, that we were able to visit in uh, this current um, CODEL. And we found that uh, in, in many of the conversations we were in, um, they told us about the, the process of uh, diplomacy, um, development and, and defense being the approach in, uh, in the way that we are conducting our policy in Africa. Um, and I'm curious to know if there is um, a balance between these three. Um, have we found the right balance? Uh, and is there an internal policy that guides that balance? Um, and have there been cases where we have decided to advance one um, more than the other in certain parts of, of Africa? Thank you. We're always looking for the right balance. And uh, we really appreciate it when you get out to visit our posts because I think you get to see these um, some of these issues and, and the work in progress. I think from the time that AFRICOM, the Africa Command was established, it has always taken what we call a 3D approach. So serious attention to the other two Ds besides defense. So defense, diplomacy, and development. And we have been part of the, the discussion with AFRICOM since since the beginning, really, and it, it's not always easy, but I think AFRICOM does convene uh, strategic planning meetings, and they include our colleagues from State Department, they include the, the development colleagues uh, twice annually, strategic, big strategic meetings, and, and of course at the country level that coordination is always going on. Um, uh, our, I think our colleagues in, in the Defense Department in AFRICOM will always say that prevention is the most important element of what we're doing so that they can, they can secu do security forces action and yet uh, that won't solve the problems forever and we certainly appreciate their support in that and we work together. We've got, for example, um, some embedded uh, exchange of uh, staff even with um, uh, SOCAF, um, and you may have met them 
when you were in your travels. But uh, one of the biggest issues that we always talk about it, and we always come back to is um, when we're talking about violent extremism and, and conflict and violence, where you have security forces present, um, a lot of the time the actions of those security forces are responsible for driving people to radicalization. Mm -hmm. And we know that we have the evidence that shows that. So um, that's a constant part of our conversation that if they've got the relationship with the security forces, that's one of the big issues that we have. And we've got to build that, that relationship between governments and the people so the government is solving problems. The people uh, feel like the government is not just creating problems for them or harassing them. Yeah, and, and Chairwoman, if you let me just um, quickly uh, follow up with um, a, a question. When we were in Burkina Faso, um, one of the first things that we learned um, was that there was an uptick uh, in terrorist attacks by 208, you know, 70 percent. Um, and in in the conversations um, that we were in, there was lot of lots of conversations about the work that USAID was doing. There was some conversations about. Um, our, our approach to diplomacy um, and almost no real urgent investment in, in defense in, in that area. And I, I remember, um, you know, the chairwoman myself and uh, uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who was on, on that CODEL with us, um, ha having this, this feeling um, that we were dropping the ball because, right, we should be able to shift our resources, our energy um, on where it's going to be most effective. And in this particular case, it looked like there, there was a problem that we needed to pay attention to and we were diverting our energy um, uh, elsewhere. And it was the same case in, in Niger where, you know, there was uh, support for educational programming and, and, and others that could be deterrent um, and, and we were investing most of our energy on defense and not on development. Um, and, and we saw the same thing in, in Djibouti in, uh, when we visited in regards to the Somalia policy. It just seems everything is always lopsided and I want to make sure, um, you know, and maybe have a follow up uh, on, on how we can get these policies to be coherent, balanced, so that we can actually have uh, our policies be effective and, and, and do the job they're intended to do. Thank you. Um, Representative back. Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, let me just ask you again, Administrator uh, Anderson, as you know so well, if drugs to mitigate HIV are not delivered on time in, in an usable fashion, HIV positive individuals are at risk of getting sicker and since ARVs reduce the viral load, uh, it acts as a prevention uh, as well, which means others might not catch this hideous disease. Yes. My question again, um, and maybe you want to provide a further elaboration for the record, but you know, Chemonix was awarded in April of 2015, the award. Uh, I believe, and we had a very extensive hearing on it, and then many, many conversations uh, that they really failed miserably in, in undertaking that that contract, uh, what reforms have been taken? I asked a series of questions before about people who like the technical evaluation committee, are they, uh, does it include members in the field? But where are we on that, if you could? Uh, secondly, on the PRC, um, on October 15th, the Congress, the House, not the full Congress, passed my bill that I pushed for four separate Congresses called the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. Um, it passed overwhelmingly, totally bipartisan. It'll be coming up in the Senate probably a, as a companion bill under Marco Rubio, maybe today, certainly this week. Um, if Do our African friends, we raise it all the time. I know the chairwoman and I raise it all the time. Chinese debt is crippling now for many of the, the African countries. Uh, when Bono was pushing uh, debt relief, uh, all of us rallied around it and debt relief was done, I think, in a very magnificent way. But now a new round is coming, not just to us, but especially to the Chinese. What kind of influence might we have on them uh, to initiate debt relief? They're piling it on right now and we all know that, that is crippling. It's crippling to countries, it's crippling uh, to individuals. 
added to that, and you did, made reference to it, both of you, you know, the, the way the Chinese do business, bad governance model, there's no Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, so they can, they can buy their way into certain industries, and they bring their own workers, they don't hire locally. Ghana has had terrible, as do have others, um, response to, what is this? Why can't we hire locally? You know, you're bringing people in from the PRC. Um, so, you know, if you could speak to Chinese debt um, and what we might do on that, and, and um, I have a lot of questions, but let me also ask on the neglect of tropical diseases, Ms. Anderson, if you could speak to whether or not uh, the, the warming is integrated. Maybe you mentioned it um, uh, in my earlier question, but it seems to me that it, it needs to be a holistic view. That's what our bill seeks to do, mm -hmm. to ensure that. Um, you know, if you're not, you, we don't want to feed the worms. We want to feed right. the future. Uh, so if you could speak to that as well. I have others, but I think I'll be out of time. Uh, okay. Oh, should we start with the supply chain management? Please. Okay, Please. because the uh, supplies for our global health programs are a critical element, and we take this very seriously. We learned some really hard lessons, as you know, and going forward, we... Uh, we absolutely have to ensure the efficiency and effectiveness of the health supply chains. And we are uh, making a special emphasis on the management of our awards now across the board, uh, but particularly on supply chain management. And we must never allow for any life-threatening stockouts in the systems. And at the same time, we have to build our, working on building our partner countries' ability to run their own supply chains. And so we have to find the right balance and build capacity where we can uh, so that we are not always in the business of, of doing the supply chain management. Is Kimani still got the contract? Uh, I, I'll probably, we'd probably have to get back to you to give you the details on the current um, uh, on the current contract and, and some of the specifics. Absolutely, sir, on the Chinese debt. What they call the one belt, one road, I call the one belt, one toll road. Uh, <laughs> and what we do is, obviously our African partners are sovereign. So what we can do is make them aware of the debt trap, what that means for them, publicize, publicize it because African publics themselves are getting very concerned with this and very disgusted. And the other thing we can do is uh, we can work with Treasury to offer technical assistance to some of these countries. But also what we do not want to see happen is for the IMF that we pay into then use our money to hawk him out of the, the Chinese debt. So we are very, very concerned about all of these things. And then the other thing that they had been doing with uh, the World Bank, getting, scoffing up a lot of the World Bank projects in Africa because they were straight low bid. So we've been working with the World Bank to make the procurement's life cycle cost where U.S. companies have a much better chance because of the uh, quality that they offer. But are we pushing best value contracting, which is obviously highly Priced over with the with way. with the World Bank, absolutely, and and our uh, our representative, of the World Bank, is very very cognizant of that. I would just say that under under Power Africa, one of the things that we've been able to do, working with the African Development Bank and their Africa Legal Support Facility, is help some of our partner countries look at the deals that are being put in front of them, the opportunities that they have, and this facility helps them to look at what actually is, um, you know, what are the international standards, what's being presented, and what are the real costs of the deal. You know, one final question. Um, we know for a fact, um, and I have a bill on this as well, it has not passed uh, yet, 115 co-sponsors on what the Xi Jinping is doing uh, to the Muslims uh, in the autonomous region, the Xinjiang region. Uh, there's at least a million people, probably far higher, uh, in concentration camps. Uh, goods are being exported here. Uh, Costco recently uh, was caught selling uh, goods that had been made in one of those camps. A whole, con whole families and extended families have been rounded up for what I believe is a genocide. They're trying to destroy the Uyghurs, the Muslims, uh, Uyghurs. Uh, people like Rabia Qadir has lost her entire family. 
Uh, she's one of the greatest human rights leaders uh, who came here years ago, testified before our committee. Uh, her whole family, <laughs> dozens of people are all rounded up. Radio Free Asia, all their folks um, who have family back in, in that region uh, have been rounded up and put into prison. Uh, do we convey to our friends in Africa how bad of a governance model, and especially to those that might have a majority uh, uh, Muslim leaders, like, like in, like in um, um, uh, Nigeria, where to speak out to Xi Jinping, uh, I've raised it with other leaders when I meet, I said, please, the OIC, for example, needs to be dogged in calling Xi Jinping to account for this extermination campaign, changing the language, changing their faith, trying to, uh, it is genocide, you know, destruction of a people in whole or in part, uh, or a religion, it's what they're doing. Uh, did I get that? I mean, when you, when you, in, you know, Xi Jinping can come bearing gifts, but they're always with a huge price and the mm -hmm. bad governance model, and above all, how he grossly mistreats his own people. Hong Kong is just in the news, uh, but what he does on the mainland constantly, and now what he's doing against the Muslims is outrageous and, and unconscionable. Thank you very much for your ferocity. You know, I'm a refugee from communism myself, so that's very personal. Uh, it, it, is a, it is a very keen issue for us to solicit our African partners' awareness to this issue. Uh, unfortunately, as you can imagine, the Chinese are also ferocious in trying to get the Africans to support their point of view, and what they often do is leverage their enormous debt advantage with these countries to say, oh, you know, you want better uh, debt terms? By the way, so uh, a absolutely, thank you very much, sir, for that. Thank you. Uh, Representative Weld? Thank you. Um, I want to get back to Representative Houlihan's point that the U.S. shows its priorities around the world with its investment of dollars. I mean, that's frankly what it comes down to. And I'm, a, I'm concerned about what I see as the inconsistency between stated objectives of trying to overcome the Chinese in, um, advantage in Africa, um, but not, not in deploying enough dollars to do so. Um, we know that the uh, administration's requested budget for Africa assistance is $4.94 billion for fiscal year 2020, which is a decrease of 29.7% um, from 2019. And with respect to the President's Prosper Africa initiative, there was a request for $50 million, which is less than 1% of the overall budget for Africa for fiscal year 2020. And I just don't see how we combat Chinese presence and influence if we're allocating such a small amount. I'm on the Prosper Africa web website, which is a U.S. federal government website of the International Trade Administration administered by the Department of Commerce. And it specifically says that it's a, gov a Prosper Africa is a U.S. government initiative that unlocks opportunities to do business in Africa, benefiting companies, investors, and workers both in the Africa and the United States. Um, it goes on to say, for years, companies have asked the U.S. government to make it easier to access its trade and investment support services. Prosper Africa answers this call by providing a one-stop shop that makes the full range of those services available to U.S. and African businesses and investors and helps to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit of Americans and the people of African nations like never before and goes on. And then it says, it acknowledges that six of the ten fastest growing economies in the world and over one billion consumers are in Africa um, and, and that p producers in Africa see a U.S. consumer market of more than 300 million people that already has a purchasing power of $13 trillion, the largest in the world. So my question to you is, why are we not devoting more? Why is why a 30%, almost 30% decrease in requests for overall funding to Africa and only 1% of that budget being devoted to this Prosper Africa project? I, that's for you, Mr. Najee. All right, it's a, I, I was only referring because it's USAID's, but as I have said in, in testimony before, I wish we had had Prosper Africa 20 years ago. There should also be a sign there saying under construction because Prosper Africa has not been fully built up yet. The concept is phenomenal. 
if we do it right, it will be one of the long-term legacies, as has been AGOA, as has been PEPFAR. Because 20 years ago, we were pounding the tables of African ministers of trade and saying, you need a one-stop shop to attract business. The United States has never had a one-stop shop. We desperately need one on this side to promote Africa as a destination for investment for businesses like from where I come from in West Texas, the small and medium-sized businesses that create the most employment. And then we need on the Africa side to tie the African companies together and in the middle. We're, we're in complete agreement on so, that. So, so it's a great concept. It, it, we, Why we are, only 1% of the budget? We are constructing it now, and we're starting with this. What needs to happen is to put that connector in place. As I said, what's not being evaluated in that budget is all of the phenomenal work that all of our embassies, you know, our 51 posts in Africa, are energetically doing. And as I offered earlier, I will get you a list of recent wins where the United States has actually won thanks to the deal teams at our U.S. embassies. So I am, honestly, I am delighted for any funding whatsoever to start with, and, and we will go forward, and I hope in 20 years we look back and say that this was a phenomenal, phenomenal advance. Can you, do I have time? I, how much capital has China invested thus far? I think, China, I think China's investment in Africa is about 40, billion, ours is 47 billion, their annual trade is much higher than ours. But again, that's state-owned companies, if, if you want to put together the U.S. private sector. For example, South Africa, where China is not succeeding that well, because we have 800 American companies involved in South Africa. We employ 200,000 South Africans. We're responsible for about 20% of uh, South Africa's GDP. So where you have U.S. companies heavily involved, so we're the ones who I, win. I think your, your, your answer, I think we're very much in agreement, but I think your answers have sort of driven home the point that more investment, not, not less. A absolutely. On this kind of project. Thank you. I just have two final questions. Uh, very concerned about Ethiopia. And uh, with all of the promise, I was so excited to see the Prime Minister get the Nobel Peace Prize, but yet peace is not... Um, you know, they haven't found it internally, a lot of uh, problems lately. And so I wanted to know what we're doing in terms of how are we supporting Ethiopia? We have, uh, wow, th that, that's one example where we actually did scramble and come up with tremendous additional resources in a very short period of time to respond to what Prime Minister Abiy is trying to do. I, th I think it's difficult to articulate the enormity of his efforts and his jobs. You know, leaving aside the tremendous work he's done externally, the internal part is, is immense. Uh, I had two tours in Ethiopia, first in the 80s in the dictatorship, then later with Nellis. I, I've been very close touch with Ethiopia, but he is totally shifting a system that had been built on the statist model to one that's built on, on private sector capitalism, investment, etc. So out et of FY 2020, what specifically are we the, doing? I, I believe that what this shows is somewhat misleading because the numbers here that we're asking for are only part of the U.S. government investments in Ethiopia because this is, this is just state AF and USAID AF because right. there's so, so in those many. two categories, what we're asking for 203 program. million on those two categories, what? and again to help institution building because to me that is the key right. to long-term success. As, so as we all know, can you give me a couple of examples of the institution building that we're doing? How are we doing it specifically? It's three of the early areas where we're, we we've always had a. A relatively large program in Ethiopia, but with the, with the new changes, we're pivoting to support some of the key reforms. So, some three of the key areas that we have moved uh, quickly to support are the uh, Attorney General's Office uh, and the Supreme Court, as well as the National Independent Electoral Commission. I Good. Think it's and what are we board. doing in those three areas? We're providing capacity building. And how is that done? Do we have uh, private contractors doing it? How are they doing it? What I'll, specifically? I'll have to get back to you okay. with the details I really would like yeah. very specific examples. So for example, if a company has a contract, what is their contract to do? Mm -hmm. How much is it? How is it evaluated? How is it awarded? 
uh, it would just be very helpful mm -hmm. to, to understand. Because in the general terms, I, I get it. But specifically, you know, uh, what is it? And uh, in terms of Sudan, I wanted to ask you about that as well, wanting to know the status of USAID to Sudan and what are we doing to assist them in their transition? And also, uh, where are we with the sanctions? Is there any consideration around the state sponsor of terrorism? And, you know, considering while they were in the process of making that transition, the number of deaths, the toll that it took. Mm -hmm. So how are we responding to all of that? Oh, absolutely. Um, Sudan, the, the bottom line for me, the most important thing, is we now see Sudan as a productive partner that we can deal with and not an adversary that we were dealing with before. Of course, we applaud them for being able to come up with a transitional government in the midst of a crisis, unlike the South Sudanese, which have been failure after failure. Uh, we will do everything possible to support the transition. We just had another Friends of Sudan meeting here in Washington a couple of weeks ago. We are engaging with them continuously on how we can address uh, the state sponsor of t terrorism issue, how we can get to the end of that again. We see ourselves now as dealing with a partner not somebody who's, you know, trying to, so to dodge their way out. So where are we with the state sponsor of terrorism? We're in the midst of it. It's, uh, everybody I speak with in the international community, their first question is, when will you end the state sponsor right. of terrorism? And my answer to them is always, my dear friends, it is not an event flipping a switch. It's a process because there are certain conditions that have to be arrived at with them. And, and when we get to that point, but I can assure you, Madam Chair, we are moving as expeditiously as we possibly can. So we're, we're going to plan a trip fairly soon, and um, I would appreciate it if you could follow up with as specific as possible. What does that mean? What does sure. the process look like? Where are we in sure. it? What's the time frame? What are the measures that we're using? I would appreciate all and of I'd that. And I'd be happy to do that in a different format forum. Yes, 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 I understand. Any final Questions or thoughts? Sure. Uh, Dinesh, if you could just speak to uh, Cameroon for a moment. Uh, a few weeks back, um, uh, another congressman and I uh, talked to our ambassador, who's doing great work under horrible circumstances. Um, but a man whose friend um, was decapitated came to us. He worked with the Bible Society. Uh, he, we had him as a witness uh, before our hearing on Cameroon a few years ago. And then his wife uh, had her arms uh, severed. He, I mean, the brutality is, is horrific, as we all know, and as the gentlelady, uh, the chairwoman knows, distinguished chairwoman who went there. Uh, you know, what are, could you give us an up-to-date, where are we on this now? Are, are there any hopeful signs? Uh, I know there's dialogues that are called for and dialogues that are you know, participants don't show up or don't participate in any meaningful way. The role of the churches and the, and, and the, uh, the various faiths of all kinds um, in hopefully brokering uh, sustainable peace. Thank you very much for asking that. As I have mentioned to the, uh, to the committee before, Cameroon for me is also very personal, having spent time there as a deputy chief of mission. Uh, I follow it very closely. I wish I could be optimistic with you. Uh, we fa follow very closely the process going on in Switzerland. That's supposed to be a, a, a dialogue. We also follow very closely the national dialogue, which unfortunately in many respects seem to be more symbolic than concrete. Uh, Deputy the, Cardinal Toomey's initiatives? Yeah, w yes. It was a great initiative, but at, at the end of the day, he, he, here's the, the bottom line, sir. I have no doubt that there are people around President Bia who are telling him that, Mr. President, you can win this militarily. The truth is, it's not going to be won militarily. As we have seen in our own history and as, as has been evident in other places, you can't wipe out a thought militarily. Uh, the other thing is, violence begets violence. It gets worse and worse and worse. Every day more Cameroonians, who in the beginning were probably very loyal Cameroonians, are starting to think that maybe uh, declaring a, a separate country is the way we want to go. Um, it, uh, the North has its problems with extremism, but the problem in the Anglophone area 
And I know the Cameroon government does not like to use the word Anglophone because they say we have 120 languages. It's true. But there were two colonial histories of the two Cameroons that came together. So there has to be a true dialogue. There has to be also devolution of power to the region. Now, allegedly, the government of Cameroon has said that there will be, but it's, the proof is always in the implementation. So that has to be put out there as real as a, is it federalism, is it a type of decentralization? Something so that the people who are still moderates can gravitate towards that. Because, sir, for the third year in a row now, the Cameroonian children in the southwest and the northwest are not going to school for practical purposes. So are we going to have a whole lost generation of Cameroonians? Phenomenally sharp country, should be easily middle income and forward. So I'm, I, I wish I could give you better news.